Welcome back to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast, where we share experiences out in the field and educate others through landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more with other photographers from around the world. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about my trip to Florida. Um, Ryan's going to be interviewing me about it. Um, and, you know, we're happy to be back here. Uh, before we get started, we do want to remind you guys, uh, check out all our social medias. Uh, we've got Patreon. Um, if you'd like to support the show monetarily, um, we've got Instagram, YouTube, um, Spotify, all those various platforms. You could leave a review or um, leave a comment and anything like that would be highly appreciated. Yep, definitely. For sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, maybe you could just start with uh, Henry just talking about where you went and uh, how long you're there and just go from there. Yeah, so I went to North Captiva Island in Florida. So I don't know if you're familiar with like the Sanibel and like Captiva Islands, Ryan. I don't know if you've heard of those before. Uh, no, enlighten me. <laughs> so um, it's basically it's down in Southwest Florida. So it's on uh, the Gulf of Mexico, um, which is nice. I've always preferred the Gulf of Mexico personally. Like it's it's less wavy, and um, I've always found it to be prettier, um, more like. Um, pretty beaches and like less like dramatic like weather conditions um, so it's it's on the gulf and it is actually an island um, and it used to be captiva is a pretty popular island uh, but north captiva it split in 19 i believe it was 1912 uh, during a big hurricane so it got completely cut off um, from captiva island um, so it became north captiva and I think in the fifties or so people came back and, uh, began to build houses on it. Um, and there are bridges to Captiva, but to North Captiva, there's no bridges. So you have to take a ferry out there. So I, I was pretty much glued to that one location, um, on the Island, uh, which actually was not a negative at all. It's, there was plenty of stuff to do there, plenty of stuff to shoot. Um, but you do have to take a ferry. Um, so I got down there on a, uh, Sunday. Uh, we had a lot of flight cancellations. I was originally supposed to get there on a Saturday, but uh, we did make it down on a Sunday uh, about midday. And um, as soon as I got there at the ferry port, I wasn't even on the island. At the ferry port, I saw a ready turnstone, hmm. uh, which was a lifer for me. Uh, Congrats. I, yeah, it was it was awesome. Uh, I quickly realized that those are very common uh, in Florida and they're everywhere. So I saw <laughs> probably like a thousand of those little guys. Uh, very very cute shorebirds and very very interesting behavior um and also at the docks of this ferry uh there were just pelicans and they they let me walk right up to them like they just wow. did not care got you know like full frame headshots of these pelicans uh with like mangroves behind them um so like instantly i knew like this is going to be an amazing like photography trip um the cooperative nature of the birds um it's it's just crazy in florida you know, people talk about it as an amazing birding destination, um, and I definitely agree with that. Not just because of like the variety of birds, but just the the ability of these birds to just be, you know, in coexistence with the humans. I mean, it's crazy. Like, and I learned that right away. So that's awesome, man. Yeah, congrats to the lifers and everything with that too. Um, yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people do mention. I mean, I think we talked about on the show before on some episodes ago. Um, about like perspective and everything so like you're out traveling out of state and to you know the you know the average person i guess that lives there in florida may be like eh, ruddy turnstone that's like that's like your your gull or something or your your duck you know your average duck or you know just kind of like the same idea as like it's just always there but like to you it's like you're getting off this ferry and that's the first thing you see and it's just like sets you on this course for the trip of like all these life birds and all these cool photo opportunities yeah, for sure. And that, that's a great point. Like, um, you know, Florida people, they might find like a uh, different types of sparrows rare because um, mm -hmm. they don't get a lot of those down there. So it's just it's all about perspective for sure. Yeah, um, definitely. But I think even with these Florida common birds, they're like they're so beautiful and they're just like they're so interesting. Like even the goals there are different. You know, I mean, I'm sure we get some of the, the goals um, up here that we get, you know, down in Florida through migration and whatnot. But um, just kind of a wide variety in every flock of gulls I would see, um, you know, like Franklin's gulls and laughing gulls and all kinds of different ones. Uh, so even that was really cool. Skimmers, uh, you know, just really unique birds. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I was on the ferry, um, 
Yeah, I didn't really shoot anything on the ferry because, you know, it was kind of fast moving and whatnot. But um, when I got to the island, I pretty much started shooting right away. I was just really excited and I I'd been stuck traveling for like 18 hours. So I was just like, I need to get out and shoot. Um, so right out, we rented a condo um, and right outside the condo was an osprey just uh, perched on a, a palm tree. Um, so that was pretty fun. Just kind of an initial thing to get me into the island. Um, and then I found uh, a pair of ibises. Um, and once again, they let me get right up to them. Um, you know, if you saw an ibis in Louisville, it would fly away instantly. <laughs> you got anywhere close to them. Um, and here in Florida, I could just get right up to it. Um, once again, that nice mangrove backgrounds, because that's what Southwest Florida is really just a lot of mangroves, which is just a really pretty environment. Um, so yeah, I got some brown ibises. They were white ibis as a species, but they're they were the brown variety. Uh, I got those with some mangroves behind them. <laughs> um, and I, I went right to the beach after that. Um, this was a cloudy day when I got there, which was pretty nice. So I could kind of shoot right when I got there and spend a couple hours getting to know the island. Um, I also I found another lifer pretty much right away, a, a willet. Um, it's a larger shorebird. Um kind of more skittish um you know they're still very cooperative compared to like uh, migratory shorebirds but um i was able to get some cool shots of them on the beach um, and there's just something magical about kind of laying eye level um i brought my skimmer like a little ground pod like tripod thing um and getting eye level down there is just amazing with the sand and the the ocean as a background uh it's just there's no other look like it. It's it's super cool. <laughs> That's a proper way to shoot shorebirds and other you know stuff like that too. I'd say. Oh yeah. <laughs> Is it? Ha- yeah. It, have you ever done that before with uh, using like a skimmer or anything? I have before, um, but never for shorebirds. So I've I've used it for waterfowl quite a bit, but not shorebirds. And because like I did a trip to South Carolina last year, but I hadn't really discovered perspective that much. Like I would. I would maybe get down to my knees or something, but I would, wouldn't get as flat as I did here. Um, and I'll tell some stories later. You know, laying down on the sand is not always the safest thing in the world for gear and whatnot. Um, there were some casualties, um, but uh, it's it's worth it for the shot. So. <laughs> yeah. To some, um, to some extent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and just the rest of the day, I, I played around with that cloudy lighting. Um did a couple landscapes because it was kind of some dramatic clouds and whatnot. So I was pretty happy with this trip too. Um, of course there were a lot of birds, but I was able to kind of get back in the landscape ph- photography, um, do some really interesting stuff there as well. I definitely did more wildlife, but I definitely did do a pretty good amount of landscapes. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's interesting to see with, even with like your previous trips to like uh, Michigan and stuff, you like did lots of landscapes and you're kind of just like in a variety of the, you know, the local scene from where you're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Cause I mean, I don't really know when I'm going to return to this Island. I'm sure I'll be back to Florida in the next couple of years, but probably another area. So it's good to kind of capture it all. So mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, how long did you yeah. say you were there? So I was there, um, Sunday, um, a Sunday through a Saturday. Um, I had like half a day on the last day. So I, I got five full days of shooting with kind of a half on each end. So it was great. Um, there were maybe two cloudy days where I could shoot all day and I pretty much did shoot all day. Um, and the rest of the days were sunny, which was fine because you know, you need a break when you're shooting that much. So I would just shoot in the morning light. Um, I'd shoot in the evening light and it it was honestly perfect. Um, so it worked out pretty well. Um, and yeah, so that, that was kind of day one. Um, and like I said, that was cloudy. Uh, So I could kind of scout the Island a little bit. Um, the island is actually three fourths nature preserve. Uh, and the first day I didn't even go into nature preserve. I didn't really know too much about it. Um, I'd wish that's my one regret. I wish I had gone into that preserve earlier. Um, it took me until about uh, Tuesday to really find like the magical part of the reserve that had like, you know, like thousands of birds. Uh, but, uh, you know, I still got to explore. Uh, unique parts of the island the first couple of days so mm-hmm. what was holding you back from going there was it just you just weren't like aware of it or something well the, this island it's it's so there's only like like maybe 50 60 people that live on the island 
Um, so it's, there's not any really trail maps. It's, it's really just, you kind of have to find things yourself. So the second day I went into the preserve, but I actually didn't make it to the far end of the island. I was trying to get there, <laughs> but I had no idea how to get there. Um, so, uh, I just kind of explored the, the center of the preserve, uh, instead of kind of the, the far end. Um, but yeah, on that, on that second day, um, the second day morning, um, I got a little bit frustrated, uh, because, uh, I, there was kind of, there was a lot of warblers on the, on the island, um, but I actually didn't get any warbler pictures, which is totally okay because of some of the stuff I got later, like the shorebirds and, um, kind of the, the waiting birds. But, uh, the warblers, I realized because of these thick mangroves and there was only one path, so it's really hard to get them. Um, I did see a Northern Perilla that was a lifer for me, um, for the first time it landed on a branch right in front of me, but I accidentally switched my camera to manual focus and I, I missed the shot. <laughs> oh, uh, no. But so I was a little bit disheartened there. Um, but then right after that, I kind of forgot, um, about all that. Cause I found a tortoise. So this Island has like hundreds of these big tortoises. They're, they're like huge. They're like. They're like the size of like a snapping turtle, uh, but they're not snapping turtles. They don't, they don't do that. They're very peaceful, very cooperative. So rather than the telephoto for these guys, I'd just take out my 16 to 35 wide angle, get some really unique shots with these tortoises with like the palm trees above and the, the sky above. Uh, so those guys were super fun to work with and just something you won't see pretty much anywhere. Yeah, so so wide angle is something Have you ever that shot I really wanted to with tap that kind into, of and before? I, I did a good amount of that on this trip. Um, I'll get into some more examples later, but on that first day, I really tried some cool tortoise stuff. Um, it was just really cooperative, so it really allowed for that. Uh, and I, you know, I'd wish I'd done more wide angle. Like I, I did probably four shoots with a wide angle. I wish I'd done more, but um, the stuff I did capture with that is really cool. So very unique for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Congrats, congrats on the uh, the lifer with the parula, and then yeah, the tortoise is really cool. Thank you. Yeah, and there was there was another um, lifer too. It was a um, a viri. Mm. I think it's called a viri. Yeah. Yeah, thrush. Uh, is it a thrush? Yeah, it's a type of thrush. I'm not sure. Pretty sure. Okay. Could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, um. Yeah, it's a theory. A viri. Once again, landed right in front of me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really my camera's fault. It's my fault. I just wasn't prepared. You know, sometimes <laughs> when those birds come right up on you, you just, you scramble. Oh, yeah. Um, and you miss the shot. Yeah. So. Yeah, sometimes the moment happens so fast. It's like, what can you really do? Uh -huh. You know, if you're, yeah. if you're looking to get a good shot, is it composed well? Or is the lighting even right? You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. stuff like that can happen, especially in the moment. when it's like the thrill and the excitement's, you know, going off at an all-time high. Mm-hmm. So my uh, my first gear casualty occurred that morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, I discovered the beach um, on of the preserve, which is really cool. Um, and I was shooting shorebirds, and it was kind of partly cl partly cloudy, so I waited for the sun. It was harsh light at this point, but I waited for the sun to go behind the clouds, and I shot some cool um, sanderlings and uh, sandpipers. Um, amongst the seaweed which is really cool so like when you lay down it doesn't look like ugly seaweed it just looks like beautiful green kind of textures um and i kind of got their little heads popping up um so I, I worked with stuff like that uh but unfortunately uh being a you know not an ocean dweller um i forgot about tides so i had my binoculars uh <laughs> set like down the beach a little bit um, and the tide took them. So I oh. lost my new pair of binoculars. Are you serious? Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to um, hear that. It's it's all right. But uh, it was worth it for the shots, honestly. Like, I, I wouldn't trade it, you know. I may have missed something if I was paying attention to my binoculars. Uh, I'm lucky it wasn't something worse. Uh, that's... But that's just a good note for anyone out there. Um, for the rest of the week, pretty much, I put my bag up where the by the dune grasses. Uh, you know, in that grassy area, you know, the water doesn't reach up there. And that's really the only safe part of the beach um, that and behind it, because if you get to the all sandy part, that means at some point, uh, you know, water's been over that. So um, that's that's a good recommendation mm -hmm. just so you don't lose your gear. So 
Yeah. Am I visualizing this right? You said, okay, so like you're you're on the beach, right? But then your binoculars are like ahead of you, like closer to the water. Is that what you meant? No, they were actually um, actually like behind me. So I. Oh, wow. Okay. I wasn't afraid. The waves were pretty low this day. So I let the waves kind of like come up. Uh, so I was using the skimmer. So my camera was elevated. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the rain cover. So I wasn't afraid to have the waves kind of come in. Um, so the binoculars were like a little bit up the beach from me, like, um, like vertical, well, not vertical, but like, it's hard to explain with directions, but they were like to the right of me. Okay. If I'm facing towards the, the water. Yeah. Um, and, and they were up a bit, but that wave was far enough up that it was able to grab them and just kind of pull them out. Mm. But since it was behind me, I couldn't see it. So. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Ugh. So that's that's just a good note. I mean, I'm sure you know all the more tropical photographers understand this. Um, it's just something you have to realize. Like I, I shoot around Michigan at the lake all the time, but the tides there really aren't major tides, so I'm just not used to that. Um, so it's just it's a good thing to learn. Good learning experience for sure. <laughs> yeah. What what pair of binoculars were they? Um, they were the shoot. Uh. I do not. I cannot remember for the life of me. Oh, okay. Was, okay. As long as I got them as a gift. Um, they were they were pretty nice, like a hundred twenty dollar pair. Oh, okay. Um, they were they're like eight by forty, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something like that. I was gonna say as long as it's not like a pair of like Zeiss or Vortex or mm-hmm. Swarovski or something. You know. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Yeah. That'd be terrible. So did you do the rest of the trip without binoculars and just like using your telephoto to like look at birds and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it worked out pretty well because um, – there's a voice crack. Okay. Um, <laughs> it worked out pretty well because, uh, you know, I mostly shot in a beach environment. You don't really need them. Like the birds are so close to you and they don't care, so you can really spot them just by eye only. I wear glasses, so I, I can pretty much see all the details and kind of ID the birds like that. So Yeah, that's fair. And they're probably – I mean – I would imagine they're a lot more out in the open too compared to like a woodland mm-hmm. or something or even a wetland to some extent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, normally if I was like shooting in Louisville or something, I'd have the binoculars around my neck. Um, but um, in, you know, Florida, when you're laying down on the beach, you can't really do that. It gets annoying. You know, if it's kind of like dangling as you're laying down. Mm-hmm. So that's why I had it set aside. You know, normally it'd be always be on me, but in Florida, you know, you don't want to get it sandy or anything. So you, try to set it to the side or something so Mm -hmm. i bet that skimmer also helped with keeping sand off of your camera too right well yeah kind of (laughs) oh no i mean when the tide came in no (laughs) no it's not it's not a bad story but every every night uh, my camera would be covered in sand i mean Mm -hmm. like even with the rain cover like this is probably the finest sand i've ever been around so the sand got everywhere so i just would have to do spend about 45 minutes every night cleaning it Mm -hmm. um but really, I wouldn't trade it for the world with all the sand. I mean, it was worth it. It really, for the shots I got, it was insane. Especially later in the week, like once I really got my bearings on the island, it, it was awesome. So, right. And as weird as it sounds, like using your camera gear and everything out in the elements kind of like reminds you about taking care of it. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. you know, it goes, oh, yeah, for sure. like this is a fragile piece of equipment that gets me what I want: the photo, the image. Uh-huh. But like, yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I've never been in quite a sandy environment like that, but I can only imagine. Yeah, and also I I just invested in you know like more expensive photo equipment and it's it's supposed to survive in those kind of conditions so and it pretty much did hold up um, so it you know it, I knew it could survive it I just I still was careful you know using that rain cover uh, but there's nothing you can do to keep sand out of there I mean it'll get in there no matter what yeah so it's almost inevitable yep. as long as you don't switch mm-hmm. lenses or something like that horde <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, so the so the next night, um, that's Monday night, um, that same day of the binocular shoot, just in the evening, um, I we went with some uh, family friends, so there was like a birthday party there, so I didn't have a lot of time to shoot that night. That's really the only night I didn't like go out somewhere for sunset, um, but I took my camera, of course, because how could you not on an island? Um, and the the birthday party like event was by a pond. Um, there was a flock of about probably 15 ibises. Um, these were more of the white variety. Um, and there was a super pretty light, just kind of soft, diffused light coming through the clouds um, on these kind of curvy trees. It's probably my favorite ibis shots I got. 
um, just really unique. There was a lot of background separation, and I, I really just loved the curvy branches. So that was fun. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, that was pretty much day one, my first full day. Um, day two, um, we rented a boat, uh, my whole family and the, the family we were visiting. Um, so we went to a nearby island. Didn't do a lot of shooting there, but I did visit like this this famous manatee hole. Um, and I got to see a bunch of manatees. It's it's really hard to photograph. You, you can't really, honestly, because they, they mostly stay in the water. Uh, but just a really cool experience. I've never really seen too many manatees before. And there were like 20 in this one little area. So that was awesome. Hmm. That'd be cool. Yeah. Would you ever go back and like shoot them with like your camera in like an underwater housing? So I wouldn't go to that particular location because it has crocodiles. Oh, um, okay. Because it's, it's brackish. So it's a mix of fresh and salt water. Mm -hmm. uh, but the island itself also has tons of manatees. So I'd definitely do it there. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah. Was that, mm -hmm. was that kind of like on your itinerary for the trip or was it just like a, like a side thing that was a little bit of su uh, surprise? Yeah, that was that's been on the itinerary for a while, and it was super cool. We we stopped at a couple different islands. Uh, we also stopped at a sandbar. Um, I did some wide angle goal stuff because uh, it was harsh light, so maybe not the best for long lenses. But with that um, wide angle, I could do some really cool stuff. You know, getting like the landscape around the sandbar um, with like a, a single goal in it. Like that's probably my favorite shot from that shoot. Um, just kind of a really cool thing to play around with. Yeah, and it's neat that you're experimenting, with, uh, even when you're like at a location outside of maybe your element, you know, someplace new mm -hmm. at least. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to do, I mean, this isn't photography, but I was able to also snorkel a bit, kind of enjoy looking at the underwater landscape and just kind of seeing all that stuff down there. So. <laughs> right on. That's cool. Yep. Yep. Yeah. How, how was like maybe the habitats, like what was your favorite or like to shoot in or just be in like overall? Ooh, um, I mean probably have to be the beach just um mm -hmm. i'll get into it in a minute but like the the preserve beach like way down on the island was super wide super stunning um provided some great opportunities but uh i'll circle around to that um in a bit it's, it's really cool so sounds good yep um that night we didn't boat all day so i had time to shoot sunset um and i got probably my favorite image from the trip um, so I was shooting on about halfway down the island on a preserved beach. Um, this wasn't the widest beach in the world, but that's actually kind of nice for shorebirds. So you can, it kind of pushes them towards you, um, because the, the beach is thinner. Um, I was just kind of shooting, um, waiting for sunset. Um, I think it was probably about 30 minutes until sunset. Um, this, uh, the side of the island, the beach was on, they would have been backlit. Um, but they were kind of side lit at this time, just based on the angle of the sun. Um, and I got, this is very random. I was just photographing a, um, I think it's a marbled godwit. I'm pretty sure it's either that or a willet. I think it's a godwit, another lifer, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, but it, it took off and flew right towards me and somehow I got all the shots in focus. So I got a shorebird in flight image, pretty much full frame with the beach and the water behind it with pretty light too. So I was just like, wow. I was, I was just like, it was amazing. It was great. Flying so. towards you too. Yep. Flying straight towards me, uh, catch light in the eye. Just uh, perfect. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And as we're recording yeah. this, I'm not having any like visual of it. So I'm just like imagining this and I'm like, dude, that's like the way you're painting this picture sounds so cool. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I, I do have to give credit to my R5 because with that, I, I had the eye tracking on. So it just found the eye and just, boom like if i was using a focus point never would have gotten it so right right it wouldn't even be fast enough yeah. to even like know what mm -hmm. to get onto with the focus yeah i'm lucky i was using a fast shutter speed too i shouldn't have even been this high but i was on like 2000 for stationary subjects for like no reason <laughs> <laughs> um, but because of that in case they fly uh, i got that well <laughs> i wasn't even thinking that way oh, but okay <laughs> after the trip uh, after this shot you know i was like i'm always shooting this high Mm -hmm. yeah so that's awesome. um that's awesome. yeah and that, that was a good night too even without that like it was, it was super wavy um so i got like the shorebirds with these waves coming in behind them um but I, I was still having some trouble with backlighting when it was like super super low in the sky with the sun um that's hard like you, you see it a lot on instagram um but it's it's so hard to do 
Uh, I eventually, by the end of the week, I really learned how to do it. Uh, but I, I did struggle that kind of that first attempt at it. So, yeah, but it's also nice because, like you said, you had about like a five solid days of shooting, and that allows you so mm-hmm. much time, especially if you're like you're central in the same area to like kind of like experiment like you had been and uh, really kind of like oh yeah for sure you know, perfect the technique. Mm-hmm. So the next day was um, Wednesday, and this was kind of my the day that I discovered my favorite part of the island, which is the the far end of the preserve. Um, it's a super, super beautiful beach. Uh, it's a, it's a two mile hike out there. So I got up early one morning. I just, I said, I'm going to hike and I'm going to see what I can find. I went a different way that I did the previous times in preserve. And I discovered this wide, wide beach, stunning visuals. I mean, it was just, there was no houses out there. Uh, these beautiful yellow flowers, mangroves, palm trees. Um, I mean, it was stunning. And the shorebirds were just numerous there. Um, there were, let's see, there were black belly plovers, marbled godwits, willets, all types of sandpipers, um, ready turnstones. I saw one red knot, which was really cool. Didn't get a picture, but I saw one. Um, I think that's it, but there were so many. They were everywhere. Like, there were hundreds on this beach, um, and there was no one out there. So, that, first couple of days when I was shooting shorebirds, I was having the problem of people walking down the beach and scaring them off. Uh, but down here, since there was no one, they really didn't care about people and they would come right up to your lens. And when I say right up to your lens, like they would basically be in the lens hood at some points. <laughs> they, they just did not care. Like wow. uh, they would literally circle around you and just like, you know, feed and just hang out. And they were kind of some of the most peaceful birds I've ever met. So it was, it was awesome. Uh, so yeah, I discovered that that first morning um, or that Wednesday morning, I got to shoot them in beautiful uh, morning golden hour light. Um, and then uh, the light got too harsh. So I went back, you know, I, I did, I was able to relax on the Island, you know, swim and everything. So because of that harsh light, I didn't feel like I had to shoot all day, uh, but I knew I had to come back at sunset. So I, I went back at sunset um, I put myself in the right position and I, I nailed those backlit sunset shots. Um, you know, the silhouette stuff. I didn't get like the sun in the frame because of how high the waves were. Um, but I actually liked that look better because you can see the reflection of the sun on the waves and it, like made all this bouquet, um, with the shore birds in the foreground silhouetted. So it was super cool. That's awesome, man. Gosh. Yep. Yeah. That was, that was a dream shot for me that, the, the silhouette with the sunset colors so mm-hmm. and then maybe like i bet go ahead i uh, just I w- i've been visualizing that for years so it was great when it paid off so oh yeah for sure that one and then like like if you did get the sun in the frame you could have it like with the the subject basically placed upon it uh-huh like way everything i actually did up. not i did not get the sun in the frame um the beaches were all curved so it's nearly impossible to get like pure eye level mm-hmm. on these beaches um, without you know going deep in the water um so i which was fine honestly i, I worked with it and I, i'm happy with what i got but it, it's pretty much impossible <laughs> at this place to do that effect which is pretty interesting right right mm-hmm. yeah how were like the waiting birds like did you see lots of like herons egrets um i'm guessing is there any like wetlands that you visited like wetland habitat um yeah so i um I discovered on my last full day, which was Friday, a wetland, um, and I saw another lifer. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this. It's a model duck. Uh, I've heard uh, of it. Yeah, so it's only found in the Gulf of Mexico, which is super cool. They're fairly common there, but you know, like I said, they're only in that area. Um, and these were very skittish birds. They, since they were on the preserve side, they probably didn't know like my intentions, like. I mean, they probably don't encounter a lot of humans. This nature preserve seemed like nobody ever went there. Um, so I did kind of have to hide in a bush with, like, my teleconverter. Um, but I, I did get some good shots eye level. Um, you know, they, they look a lot like mallards, but they have this kind of distinct black eye stripe and then these very bright red um, feet. So um, you could definitely tell they're not mallards. So that, that was fun. So. Mm-hmm. Did you know right off the bat that was a model duck or did you think maybe, I don't know, I, I doubt it in the nature preserve, but like maybe it was like a domestic, like a hybrid type of mallard. 
Yeah, so it, it definitely wasn't domestic. Um, I'd seen reports on eBird. Um, there are a couple birders who seem to live on the islands. They'd reported the model duck, and I, I did my research kind of before. Um, and it definitely was modeled, which was super cool. That's cool, though. That's a really good find, yeah. Did you, mm-hmm. you, I'm guessing you used lots of eBird and checklists um, during the whole trip. So that that's actually interesting. Like, eBird was barely used. Um, really? So the model duck, I looked at reports from last year. Um, they're actually the last report on eBird was like, like three months ago in that place. So there's not a lot of people on that island. Like, there's maybe a couple birders that have been there in the past year. Um, but it's not like a popular destination just because uh, there's only like, you know, limited amounts of homes to rent out there. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you have to take a ferry to get out there. So it's, it's really kind of isolated, which is nice. So I, I just know the, the shots are unique to me pretty much. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's something exclusive and it's almost like, I don't want to say hard to access, but like very few people do at that too. And as far as I know, there's never been like a, a bird photographer on the island, which is, is pretty cool. Like, a, hmm. at least in the modern era. Uh, the birders on the island, they seem to just kind of take documentary shots, you know, just to show that they saw the bird. So, right. Right. That it's makes really sense. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the wetland habitat was cool. Um, the waiting birds, um, there weren't a huge amount of waiting birds. I, I think because of the size of the preserve, uh, I'm sure they were back in the mangrove somewhere, but that that's pretty much inaccessible. Um, but I, I was plenty occupied with, what I had. Um, but I did find, um, a great blue heron, um, on Thursday. Um, and this guy let me get right up to him once again, which I bet is crazy to you because I'm sure (laughs) just like in Louisville, the great blue herons fly at the quickest sight of you. Like they're, they're gone. Like they're Mm -hmm. just out of there. Yeah. Uh, he let me go right up full frame portraits, um, beautiful golden hour backlit. Um, so that was cool. Um, I got an osprey. Uh, I found an osprey nest. There were osprey nests all over the island, um, but I found one uh, that was fairly eye level with babies that you could actually see. So I photographed this osprey nest with babies. I stayed a safe distance. I I used my teleconverter, but I was able to kind of zoom right in there, get all the babies popping up um, with the mom as well. Super cool. Um, I've I've seen osprey before, but I had never seen the babies before. Um, and something unique about the babies is they have orange eyes uh, versus the yellow eyes, which makes a really interesting look for sure. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder how many birds look like that, you know, younger versus older. Uh huh. Yeah, it, it was super cool. Uh, and this osprey, uh, the mom flew away from the nest at one point, landed right next to me on a tree. So I got full frame portraits of an osprey in golden <laughs> light, which is amazing. So. <laughs> Is it crazy yeah. how like all these things are just unfolding to you? It's like uh-huh. it's like serendipitous, like how much, like how, almost how easy it is, maybe a little bit, like or just oh yeah, it felt surreal. Like a cheat code, yeah, yeah, cheat code, yeah, <laughs> photography cheat code, yeah. Florida these Florida birders, I mean, they they have it easy. <laughs> they have it easy. <laughs> Probably a little Obviously, bit. Obviously, there's still a, a lot of skill, but I mean, they they have an advantage, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. yeah i wonder why is it just do you think it's like the birds are just more like habituated to human activity because like the beaches in particular with like shore birds or do you think it's just i don't know being by the ocean or something i just think so many people in florida are like interested in birds i guess that they they just get they just kind of grow to know that humans aren't out to hurt them um, you know, maybe the, the reason those ducks were skittish is because they've maybe been hunted in the past or attempted to be hunted. Uh, but you know, these shorebirds and herons, you know, it's kind of illegal to hunt them. Uh, so, I mean, maybe that's it, but I, I mean, I really don't know. It's just a magical place, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I guess maybe in the case of like the shorebirds, cause they do like, that's their habitat. Right. And like so many people go to the beach. Yeah. It's like, they just kind of uh-huh. get familiar, I guess, with the people that go there and stuff and you know just integrate i guess in a way that's like eh, they're, they're not so bad like you said they're harmless mm-hmm. yeah for sure mm-hmm. except for the dogs though the the shorebirds were terrified of dogs as mm-hmm. they should be because those those you know domestic dogs will rip rip apart the shorebirds so Jeez. <laughs> yeah i imagine they probably chase them a lot too 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's why I was happy to find that preserved beach. Cause you know, there were no dogs down there. So mm-hmm. that's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I spent pretty much the rest of the trip shooting the preserve, uh, just all kinds of unique stuff. With, I did another backlit shoot, which was even better. Um, I did wide angle sunset stuff um, with a group of a uh, group of marble godwits. That was super cool. Um, I found a one legged buff breasted sandpiper. Uh, he was hopping around. It's it's kind of sad, but also kind of funny to see him hopping <laughs> around like that. Uh, not sure how that happened, but uh, that was cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it kind of tells a story too. Like people may see like, oh, it's a buff breasted sandpiper, but like. Oh, where's its one leg at? You know, makes you wonder a little bit. Maybe what happened to it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I had I had fun shooting on the beach, but also, um, you mentioned the wetlands. Like these wetlands and tidal pools would also get some shorebirds in there. Um, and rather than the typical ocean background, you got some more colorful, uh, you know, plants. You know, because Florida it does experience seasons still, so the plants were kind of on fire with purples and reds and oranges. So that was cool. Um, I also, I worked with the pond a bit more, a couple different days. Um, Got black crown night heron. Uh, Yearbird for me. I saw it last year in South Carolina, Uh, but it it was good to see that again. Um, And that was very early in the morning before sunrise. So it's not going to be the best photos in the world, but um, good experience to see them. Uh, Green heron, uh, super skittish here, which is pretty weird. Um, cause in Michigan, there's a bunch of green herons and they let me get right up to them. Uh, but here they're very scared of humans. I don't, I don't know why, but, um, I was able to get some cool green heron stuff. Mm-hmm. It just took some time and patience. So. Right. Yeah. Must be the same green herons that visit Ohio. Cause it's like, they will they pretty much fly away at the first sight of you too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite green heron shot was I shot through a bush, um, and it got, there was some like really unique textures, you know, it's not going to be in tack sharp focus because it was through something, but it's super unique. And I really like it because it, it kind of shows the elusive nature of the green heron. So, yeah, that, that's, that's a great way to like really tell more about the birds. Like, I don't know if you call it personality or behavior at that, you know, cause mm-hmm. they are much more smaller size waiting bird and the, yeah, they are very elusive and, you know, quite frankly, hard to find in a lot of cases cause they do blend in mm-hmm. so well with like their environment. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I also got Inhingas, which is super cool. Mm-hmm. Some of my favorite birds. Just super weird the way they kind of move around. Um, have, have you ever seen an Inhinga? Not in person, no. I've not. Yeah, I, I, w- I would look for them um, in Ohio because, I mean, I know we get them in Louisville, so I'd assume they'd make it up there. Um, yeah. They're, think... they're super unique. They've kind of got like this snake like movement and super cool. Mm hmm. I think they're elusive, like, in the, I mean, they're around in numbers, but, like, it's not, like, obviously the most common bird, especially even during, like, migration, but, yeah, I, I know they're yeah. around, and there's been sightings, especially, like, southwest mm-hmm. Ohio, but um, no luck there, at least yet. They're very skittish, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in Florida, and I'm sure up north, they're even worse, so. Yeah. Did you see any bitterns but, at all? No, no. Oh, uh, bummer. I don't think that island's proper bittern habitat there's not a lot of like tall reeds going into the the marshes it's more all it's more mangrove um okay so i don't think there are really bitterns on the islands um i may have caught a glimpse of a cattle egret but i really don't know it could have been a great egret Mm -hmm. maybe just a smaller one or one that's hunched over Mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to tell and then you know versus breeding plumage or all that kind of, you know, those details too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, it was a little bit sad on the black-bellied pro- plover. It was not in its breeding plumage, so it wasn't black uh, on the face. Uh, but they're still really unique because they've got the big eyes. But uh, it wasn't like peak breeding plumage for uh, the birds, which was fine. But, you know. Mm-hmm. For what it's worth, yeah. Was there any, like, goal shots you had in mind or, like, like birds you wanted to see in particular? So I, I got my goal of kind of the backlit stuff. Um, I did have a goal of finding and photographing a tricolored heron. I did not get that, unfortunately. I, I just didn't see one. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but I did want to photograph waterfowl in kind of the Florida environments. I got to do that with the model ducks. Um, so that, that was awesome. Um, and I had one more goal, um, of finding a owl. And this is, this is kind of unique. Um, I, I, I posted one thing on social media about it, but not much else. Um, so the day we left, um, the islands, we had a little time. Um, and the island's actually only about 20 minutes away once you get off the ferry uh, from Cape Coral, Florida. I don't know if you've heard about this place, but it is the burrowing owl capital of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have a lot of time, but I did some advanced research. Uh, I was able to find a burrowing owl nest, and I got the burrowing owls in golden light. So, mm. yeah, it was a great way to cap off the trip, and I got that goal of shooting an owl in Florida. So. That's awesome. Yeah, I know that's like one of the best spots. And when I heard when you first told me about your trip and going to Florida, I was like, "Oh man, I hope he sees the burrows." Yeah, I I almost saw some on the islands. I found the nest, but they never came out. Um, so I knew I had to go to Cape Coral and get them, and it it was awesome. And just literally in the middle of a a public um like a or a for sale uh, lot, there was like three burrowing owl nests just right there. They mark them. Um, so nobody builds on them or steps on them. Um, and they, they came right out cause it, it was dusk. So they were active. They weren't feeding or anything. They were actually just sitting there. I put my teleconverter on cause they're tiny, like compared to a barred owl, like they're, they're probably like six of those would make one barred owl. Like I, I can't even explain how small they are. Like they're like the size of almost a songbird. Um, probably comparable to like a screech owl or something probably more like a sawwet owl i would imagine yeah yeah probably sawwet yeah or even smaller than a sawwet almost elf um, elf owl <laughs> yeah honestly yeah and the photos i've seen in the past i could never really tell the scale like i thought they were much bigger um so but using the teleconverter i was able to get nice and close up while still maintaining a distance um i got that nice yellow eye um, in some beautiful habitat, even though if it, even though it was in a neighborhood, I was able to lay down and compress it enough to where you couldn't tell. So, right. Um, that was, that was just a great way to cap off the trip. So that's awesome. That was like the last day you said, or one of the last days. Yep. Um, we, the last night we stayed in the airport hotel and we were on the way to that hotel. So that's awesome, man. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on too, yep. but it sounds like a good time. Oh yeah, it was. I, I did a lot. I did a lot of shooting. Um, filled up every single one of my SD cards because uh, I, I don't have anything to transfer my files yet. Like I don't have a laptop. I'm gonna be getting one soon. But uh, mm -hmm. I just I brought all my SD cards, filled up every single one, <laughs> uh, which is about ten thousand photos. Uh, a lot of them are keepers. Um, so um, yeah, I did a ton of shooting. Had some fun too, you know, just nice swimming and snorkeling and just kind of, I did some bike riding, kayaking, just enjoyed the island as well. Um, so it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really soak in the sights and everything too. Mm -hmm. Yep. I do want to mention real quick the the one other casualty I had, and this one's pretty sad. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty mad about this, but it, it's my own fault. I, I was being dumb. Um, so I was shooting shorebirds. Um, I was kind of faced um, with the the ocean to my left, I was kind of face parallel on the beach. Uh, if that makes sense. Like I was more sideways rather than looking straight at the ocean. Um, and I was shooting um, and I had my rain cover on, but it wasn't fully covering my camera part. Um, a rogue wave came in, splashed my, uh, my battery grip. Um, battery grip didn't break instantly. Um, but the next day I was shooting um, and every time I would turn on the little, you know how there's a switch to use the buttons on a battery grip mm -hmm. on off switch. Yeah. So every time I would turn that on, my camera would become inoperable. I could take a picture on my camera, but I couldn't change the aperture, review my pictures, anything like that. Um, so it turns out my battery grip was like fried by, <laughs> by the salt water, oh. uh, which is pretty frustrating. Cause it's a, it's a $300 grip. Um, not cheap of course, but um, yeah, so it was just a rogue wave and I'm lucky if I didn't have that grip on, it would have hit my camera. Um, and that probably would have busted my camera. So, um, uh, but just a little bit of salt water and it, it tore right through that battery grip. So, 
Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate, man. Yeah. And especially using it the next day. I, 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 I don't know. I'm not a master electrician, but I imagine it would like short circuit your camera maybe with, you know. Yeah. I was so nervous it would do that. So I instantly took it off. That's um, good. Yeah. Good idea. Yep. Yeah. And actually, I, I did discover, though, that I, I like my camera better without a grip. Um, it's a lot lighter, um, and it actually helps me balance it on my, my gimbal head better without it. So um, I do I do have that grip insured, so I'm going to try to get um, some money for it and maybe just not buy another one and invest in a, a new L bracket or something. Because, or, um, you know, I bought an L bracket for the battery grip and not the small camera size, so. Maybe I'll invest in that or something, but and a new pair of binoculars. But <laughs> uh -huh. that's true. Yeah, yeah battery uh -huh. grips are nice though to have for that vertical shooting, like especially when handheld. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they do add a lot of like bulk and weight to the uh -huh. in the camera and lens. Yeah, you really don't realize how much weight it is. I mean, it's a lot. Like it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a hefty amount with two big batteries in there and everything. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. you know that was my big major casualty of the trip. Um, but it was honestly worth it. You know, the shots I got, um, you know, I've got enough content to post daily for the rest of the year at this point <laughs> with all the shots I got. That's, um, yeah. I'm just really, That's I'm great. really proud of it. It's just kind of the, I've never been able to really shoot shorebirds like this. So I'm just really proud of my work. So mm -hmm. yeah, not many opportunities up here. So it's like perfect reason to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Did you shoot any video at all? Oh yeah. I should, I should have mentioned that. Um, I didn't vlog um, just because I don't know. I don't really like it. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> um, I don't think it's me, um, but I, I'm going to put together a video series. I did a bunch of clips of all the animals, uh, did some tortoise videography. I did a bunch of shorebird stuff, you know, got some flying osprey, you know, just all kinds of stuff. I tried to, you know, once I got a certain amount of shots, I tried to switch over to video, video mode and, work with that for a while and it was really fun mm -hmm. um yeah it's pretty seamless with cameras nowadays just kind of switch over so um i'm glad i did a good amount of that so yeah that's awesome yeah and it works mm -hmm. yeah much in the same way as shooting a, like a photo really you know especially if it mounts it on a tripod or something mm -hmm. or a skimmer and you get some nice yeah. b-roll of it a lot of the time i just use the same uh composition too which is nice mm -hmm. so I've done that before yep. too. Yeah. That'd be cool to see that slideshow though. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do something like, I don't know what I'm going to do quite yet, but um, I'm going to try to like mix in on my Instagram feed clips every once in a while from the trip uh, and do maybe a, a YouTube series about my trip or something. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that was cool. Uh, I did 60 frames a second, you know, I didn't really have enough storage space for that super high slow-mo stuff, but 60, you know, is a little bit slowed down and it shows the motion nicely. Uh, so it should, it should be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 60 frames is still pretty buttery smooth. I would say like especially mm -hmm. for nowadays yeah, for sure. and for streaming from YouTube, it's like, or Instagram even, it should work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I, I'm so glad I went with the R5 for this trip. Like, the uh the eye autofocus yeah you know, it's not the best on like uh you know birds in like forest environments but when you put it on a a beach with the shorebirds i mean it locks on instantly nails every shot you know it's just it's amazing how far the technology's come uh, i can just really focus on composition and just everything will be in focus pretty much as long as you're using the proper shutter speed and proper technique and whatnot so Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even just in a few years, just camera technology in general too. It's like astounding. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. yep. The only thing that annoys me about the R5 is the, I think this is a Canon problem in general, is the auto white balance system. I, I just really don't like it. it. never gives me the colors I want. Um, so for this Florida trip, I set the Kelvin value each time. I actually like the results better. So. So Wait, so you're shooting in RAW, but you set the white balance? Yeah, um, because, I mean, you can obviously change the white balance in a raw editor, but I find it's better to get it as close in camera mm -hmm. uh, to kind of preserve those colors. Um, so I'll just manually set the Kelvin um, on each shoot now. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I find it works out pretty well. So. Huh. I, know, I mean, I've never asked any other, like, wildlife photographer or any photographer for that matter, but, yeah, that's something new. Never heard of it. From from what I've heard, most people use auto white balance, but 
I've just never been happy with what Canon does with auto white balance. Yeah, I think it's each camera manufacturer kind of lends itself to a certain temperature. I think that's why I've heard. If I mm-hmm. if I could be wrong, but I think like someone like Fujifilm does a like a I think cooler one, and like Nikon's warmer. I think Canon's on the more cool side. Like each mm-hmm. each one and kind more of pink too, more e- magenta. Yeah, more yes, more magenta and stuff. Yeah, so it's like each like camera mm-hmm. developer or manufacturer has their own kind of like I don't know what you call mm-hmm. it, just preference or just how it turns out, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think Canon has a wide variety of clients too, so. I think portraits are come to mind a lot with auto white balance. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's not always optimized for nature photography. So uh, that's been a, it's been a pretty good thing to kind of learn to dial that in. Mm-hmm. Kind of yeah. get the, get the white balance you want. So, yeah, that's a good point to, to raise there, especially when you have that many thousands of images to look through too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, for sure. So what are some like good takeaways from this trip? Like what were things you learned? I mean, besides your gear getting damaged, like what's some good takeaways from it? Um, well, I think, um, I think it's important to get there. If you're doing a, a a Florida trip, uh, I think it's really important to get to your location way before sunrise and, uh, way before sunset. Uh, way before sunrise, you're able to position yourself, uh, get into the spot you want, uh, maybe get some early blue hour shots, uh, maybe get some early morning landscapes, um, and you're just kind of able to look at the area. Um, and then at sunset, you know, by getting there early, you start to catch that early golden light, um, and you've got you know a couple hours of opportunity even before the main sunset comes in. So you really got to get there early. Last minute shoots never really work out in Florida. I found, you know, I tried that a couple times um, on my first couple days, and I would just miss the miss the sunset, or uh, because you know once it gets to that part where it starts to become you know really soft, uh, it it's like five minutes and it's gone. So you just got to be there. You got to be ready um, and kind of shooting all the way up to that. So mm-hmm. that's a good point to raise. Yeah, especially if you're going to someplace new or newer. Or a place that you're like unfamiliar with location wise, like you know, mm-hmm. feel free. And like you said, with the sunny days you had, like at high noon light, you could just like scout around and or just enjoy. I'm, I mean, just being there at all, of course. But yeah, you could scout around, see like what's mm-hmm. the bird life's looking like, or even like locations where you think the light will look pretty nice. You know, later on in the day or at morning mm-hmm. too. Yeah, and that that's one thing I did with planning too. Is I. I looked at Google Earth and I figured out where the sun would rise, like the specific location, where would it, where it would set. So I knew the best beaches, the best locations for the type of lighting I wanted. Uh, that was really helpful. So, hmm. yeah, that's, that's that's great. I I can't stress enough is like researching like before you go on a trip. I mean, it's fun to go in blind and a little bit, or just you know, it's, it's like the tortoise situation. It's like that was like probably a surprise to you a little bit um, in that photo mm-hmm. opportunity, but like. Yeah, just doing your research and trying to get the best shots you can get from what you've learned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, and one more subject. Um, there were a ton of lizards on the island. Um, so I, I played around with that too. So that was fun. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. I can't really ID any of them. I'm, it's not really my thing, but I'm definitely going to look them up. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of see what I got. But there were some pretty big ones. It, it was fun. Did you shoot them kind of closer in like a more macro style or you're doing like wider angle? I did like macro stuff. Okay. So cool, cool. Yes, yeah, it's, it's neat to hear all this like variety of wildlife. Like, cause I know up here in Ohio, it's like mostly birds. I would say, or just kind of mammals. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, you're getting lots of different cool stuff down there too. Yeah, and there's also uh, crabs that climb the mangrove trees. Hmm. I'm really getting shots of it, but they're they're fun to watch. These little crabs. I didn't even know crabs crabs could climb trees. Super <laughs> unique. <laughs> yeah, I, that's news to me. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Mangroves are just so cool. I, I'm I'm a mangrove enthusiast. I mean, they're they literally form entire islands, um, and they just they're, they're just probably my favorite tree. Mm-hmm. I'm a big tree guy, and mangroves are on the top of my list. So. <laughs> it's yeah, that's cool. Mangrove enthusiast. <laughs> I honestly am like, you know how like Scott Keys is a native plant enthusiast. I'm I'm a mangrove enthusiast. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Start start taking them and growing them up here. Uh-huh. 
That'd be cool though. Oh, honestly. Well, you need salt water. That's that's the problem. Yeah. What are well, some kind of the warblers? I'm just thinking of this now. You know, you said you saw the parula. Were there what kind of warblers did you see? So I I made the decision after the first day um, because of the variety of um, shorebirds and how hard it was to get warblers. Like it would take. I was out for five, four or five hours, and I only saw two. Oh, wow. Um, so I just made the decision to, you know, because I, I was there a while, but I didn't really have time to dive super into the warblers. So I pretty much just, after the first day, just focused on the, the beach stuff and the, the wetland stuff. So mm-hmm. um, I only saw the Perula and the Viri, okay. uh, which is which is fine. I was, you know, I'm obviously we're, we're going the biggest week, and uh, – even right before I left, I, I had a warbler shoot. So uh, mm-hmm. that's all I'm going to be living and breathing in the next couple of months. So I just <laughs> decided to focus on more of those uh, Florida species and, you know, just trust that I'll, I'll see a lot of warblers soon. So Yeah, and that's a good way to go about it. I'd say, yeah, you're, you're, you're shooting the type of species that, like, is, I don't know if you call it more specialized, but more, I guess, suited to that, you know, time of year and just your habitat and where you're at, too. Um, and you're right. Mm-hmm. The warblers will definitely be here and uh it's gonna, oh, yeah. it's gonna be a good time yeah um and you know it's i think i missed the peak week by just one week so i think a lot of them had already migrated up mm-hmm. uh, so i think if i was there a week earlier i would have heard and seen a lot more but right your trip's fine your tri- yeah I, I was able to focus more yeah that's fair your trip was like in mid-march right yeah i mean i got back yesterday so okay yeah Early no, so yeah, it was April. Early, so. early April. Yeah, sorry. Yep. So I think mid March um, would have probably been the best for warblers. I would guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, but I mean, it's like literally, I'm I'm so happy with the trip. It's probably my favorite photography trip I've ever done. Uh, so it, I mean, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I'm definitely already planning. I don't think I'll go back to the island anytime soon, just because of the expense, like. I went with my parents this time and I can't really afford to go myself just cause you know, it's a, a ferry and everything. Um, but I think if I go to Florida again, I'll probably base myself out of Cape Coral, you know, do a bunch of burrowing owl stuff and, you know, kind of go around that area. So mm-hmm. that sounds good. Yeah. Seeing the burrowing owls, it's like well worth the trip. Mm-hmm. Well worth yeah. the expense alone at least. Yeah. I mean, if you can just stay, in a city in Florida, you know, just you don't have to get a good hotel and you can just shoot. I mean, it's it's a long drive, but um, maybe you and I even someday we could drive down there, you know, <laughs> split the hours and shoot it up. Shoot it up. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little weird. Shoot up. The... <laughs> no, no, I I, 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 I agree. No, this, is, this sounds great, man. Yeah, it sounds like you had a uh-huh. great time. Um, I'm looking forward to yeah. seeing the photos, too. Um Thank and, you. uh, yeah, you're a great storyteller for it. Sounds like it was a good time. Appreciate it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know when I'm going to get all the photos edited. It's going to be a while because I have a huge backlog, but mm-hmm. I'm going to put Florida at the top of my list. So. You're right. And you'll roll them out over the next weeks to come or months even. I don't know how long it'll take. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll be waiting uh-huh. for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll try to put one out this week, at least one. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned it, but nice segue into our biggest week trip gonna be a good time mm-hmm. yep yeah so that's that's kind of the next thing on our horizon we're we're both super excited mm-hmm. yeah and be here before you know it uh-huh. did you did you end up watching that video ryan uh, well i'll even link that down below uh if anybody's interested in that that biggest week video yeah that was that's great to hear uh someone so great yeah they broke down like the different species they had picked of course they had photos to accompany it but like they talked about the birds and like like just more characteristics about them and uh yeah it was a really cool video about just it's mainly centered around mcgee marsh in particular but um they talked all about you know lake erie and the biggest week in general yeah it's it's gonna be great and we'll we'll do a lot of content and of course a lot of photos and a lot of video and it, it'll be great so. yeah a lot of great experiences mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yep and we got some great guests coming soon uh, all, all kinds of different variety of shooters and yeah Lots of good stuff coming up. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening and watching, everyone. And uh, see you in the next episode. Thank you.
Thank you so much for watching the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.